So the, I'm going to be talking about a conference that took place in 1958 called Mechanization of Thought Processes. Uh, and I came across this meeting when I was doing the research for my uh, book about the, the history of our idea about the brain. And it struck me as an extremely fascinating meeting. And the organization of AI in flux encouraged me to focus my attention on it. Uh, now, the approach that has been taken so far in the meeting here has been very much to not go down the traditional route of focusing on US uh, attitudes and interest in uh, AI. However, um, I think it's worth reminding ourselves that uh, in 1956, the, the Dartmouth meeting took place over several weeks in which uh, some of the key founders of AI hammered out what they thought was the agenda for research uh, in the years to come. And in, particularly, in particular, John McCarthy uh, coined the term artificial intelligence. However, this was not only a very US-based affair, it was also extremely small and pretty confidential. Whereas the meeting I'm going to talk about, which took place two years later, was very, very different. Uh, it was held in the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington on the outskirts of London from the 24th to the 27th of November 1958. There were over 200 people at it, and the output of that was a 1,000-page, uh, two-volume proceedings, which you can, I got, I managed to pick some up on the internet from eBay. Um, pretty hefty things. And they were published in 1959. So there's actually, a, unlike uh, Dartmouth, there's actually a physical legacy of the meeting that took place. And I'll be describing that in some detail. It was also immediately followed by a commercial exhibition that took place in London, the Electronic Computer Exhibition. Sadly, I don't have a copy of this rather fancy uh, program that took place. But you can see that there was this interest in fusing both academic or primarily academic research on all sorts of aspects of computer technology and its application to thinking about thought in, in various ways uh, and the commercial application of this. So the two things went hand in hand. And indeed, that was actually the starting point of the meeting that took place in 1958. You can see here a, a nice little figure showing the changes in the numbers of computers and electronic calculators in the UK that were being produced. And you can see that there was a big increase in the numbers in 1955, 1956, and that by 1958, the time of the meeting, had absolutely massively increased. And the meeting was first proposed in 1956 as an adjunct to the ex computer exhibition. So the computer builders who were growing massively all over the UK, in particular uh, in Manchester where I am and in the uh, Manchester region, they were very keen to have this exhibition as a way of showcasing uh, their products, of increasing sales to businesses, but also the export market. You can see here the massive increase in UK exportation. Most of the machines that were being in use at this time were in universities and in government, but also uh, quite substantially in private industries. And the context of that is clearly partly the Cold War, which was growing at this time. And between the decision to have the conference and the exhibition and it actually being realized, then uh, obviously Sputnik as a major symbol of the uh, Soviet advance in technology uh, took place in October, October 1957. So in looking at this meeting, I discovered it in a way. I mean, I, I, hadn't, um, I hadn't read about it. I've since found out that there are very positive views about it. So Donald Mitchie, for example, calls it a celebrated symposium. Roberto Codeschi has called it one of the most important meetings in the history of cybernetics and early AI. Ronald Klein called it a milestone. 
in the history of AI. And Richard Gregory, who was both there and also uh, gave some memoirs of how he, what he felt about it, he described it as important and fascinating. And the probably the main person to have written about this, David Clark, in his 2002 PhD, describes it, uh, which is mainly about the National Physical Laboratory, describes it as fascinating. So we've got these very positive descriptions of it in the literature, and yet there is no detailed study of the meeting, its reception and its significance beyond really David Clark's three pages in his PhD thesis. So I felt this was quite fascinating. There was this, on the one hand, people saying it's extremely important, but nobody really exploring what was said and why and what happened afterwards um, beyond this general impression. So what I'm gonna present here is an initial exploration. It's not particularly deep, uh, partly for reasons that will become apparent uh, at the end. So the National Physical Laboratory, which is where the meeting took place, was set up in 1950. This is central London. This is where the computer exhibition took place at Olympia. And the NPL is out here in uh, Surrey, in rather nice <laughs> suburban part of London. Uh, and although the NPL was focused on measurement, that was its key role and still is, uh, Turing worked there from 1944 to 47 and worked on building the advanced computing engine there. This is where the meeting took place. Uh, in fact, it was quite cramped for the 200 delegates. There wasn't enough room to accommodate them. So not everybody was able to stay on site. And many of the people uh, who were there actually missed parts of the meeting because they, they weren't able to, to stay locally. The meeting was covered as we'll see in New Scientist Time and Nature and was announced in Nature uh, in uh, early November. Here's an image that I found uh, on Getty of delegates at the meeting actually examining the advanced computing engine, which was being used, or a version thereof, which was being used at uh, the NPL at the time. And you can see down here uh, that I'm not sure whether this is a joke, a binary joke, or whether this is actually saying room 10 is here and room 11 is here, or maybe it's saying room three is here and room two is here, I'm not sure. But you can see there's the lectures and demonstrations uh, are going on. There's a nice little model, that's what you can see here, a model of the uh, advanced computing uh, engine here. So who was there? Well, uh, you can see from the composition of the delegates that this was very much a UK USA affair. And uh, unfortunately, given the desire the rightful desire of the, the meeting to actually focus on outside, you know, the, the path untrodden, the different approaches to AI. Um, but clearly, as in any conference that takes place in a particular country, it's mainly people from that country who go there. And indeed, in this case, it was mainly uh, the modal group who attended it were actually people from the NPL. So 24 people from the USA, seven from Switzerland, six from the Netherlands, six from the USR, five from France, four from Italy, and then one from uh, West Germany, Hungary, South Africa, Israel, and many other countries. Who were they? What were they doing? Well, they were mainly computer scientists, engineers, and biologists, but there was also uh, a classicist from the University of Manchester, uh, Leonard Brandwood, who was very interested in uh, computer translation. There were only, a, as you might expect, a handful of women, uh, one of whom was Grace Hopper, who's now uh, renowned in terms of her work on uh, computer science. They were mainly from universities and research institutes, the NPL, as I said, Manchester and UCL were the main uh, contributors to the attendees. And the companies they were represented were IBM, Plessy, Remington, Ferranti, English Electric, Olivetti. Uh, some of these companies still exist, others have disappeared into history. And there was also a significant uh, contribution of delegates from the US and the UK government, and of course the military, in particular uh, the UK military. As to the names who are there, well, here's some of them that you'll all recognize, Ashby, Barlow, Gregory Mackay, McCarthy, McCulloch, Minsky, Rosenblatt, Selfridge, and Walter, and many others. So what do they discuss? Why was this meeting deemed so significant by these people who I cited earlier on? 
Well, here's a breakdown of the, the talks. There were seven talks that we can briefly you know, kind of summarize as being involved in theory. There were four, including hoppers, involved in automatic programming. Uh, that is uh, the development of compilers. Four were looking at learning from a very animal point of view. Uh, seven were looking at this from a learning from a machine point of view. And there was clearly a, uh, an interaction between the two, whether that was actually fruitful or not is, a, is another matter. Three talks focused on machine translation six on speech recognition uh, and six on administration, on trying to find ways of uh, processing data or be that uh, documentation, creating databases, early databases, or thinking about how you might uh, be able to uh, process payrolls, for example. And there are also six demonstrations, which I'll describe very briefly at the end. Strikingly, the papers were circulated in advance. This is very different from a modern conference, uh, where you're lucky if you get a sensible abstract. Um, the papers were circulated in advance, and the discussions were recorded, and some of them revised by the contributors, uh, often referring to aspects of the papers, papers that were yet to be presented. So people, because they've read the papers, could say, well, you know, in Jones' paper uh, that's going to be discussed in two days' time, he says this. So the discussions actually provide a, an insight into the debates that were taking place. And there are a number of clashes of outlook and interpretation that we can see echoing down to the present day. <clears throat> and I suspect that actually the significance, the long-term significance of this meeting is that such different approaches were discussed in one meeting with a, an apparent um, mutual comprehension. Here's just some of the key words that uh, you can pull out from the uh, meeting. And I think all of these things you can see are significant today in AI, in computer science, in our understanding of what machines can do. I think that it's significant. You might want to just think a little bit about the term, whether anybody today would have mechanization of thought processes the title of the meeting. The mechanization is, is, is intriguing because many of the devices that were presented were indeed mechanical. They weren't simply electronic. And there was, we were still at this cusp between the transfer from the mechanical models that were developed in the early years of the century into a very computer-based uh, model that was taking place at this period. Uh, and thought processes, well, um, interesting approach in terms of trying to everything from thinking concepts down to how you might, as a human, process uh, data. I thought this was interesting just to get some idea of, of, despite the growth in computing, actually the limited resources that researchers had. Uh, and this was uh, posed by, by Minsky posed this question during one of the discussions, wanting to compare what the situation in uh, MIT was with that in Manchester. Well, this was MIT. They had an IBM 704 in this rather kind of futuristic setting, uh, but it was shared for, by 400 programmers. Uh, whereas in Manchester, we had the Mercury, which doesn't look quite so sexy, I don't think, and in a building that looks distinctly less sexy and still is pretty much the same. Uh, but that was shared by only 150 programmers. So there was a substantial pressure on researchers uh, in terms of their access to computer time at this stage. Now, in terms of the debates that took place, which is obviously the most interesting thing, probably the most significant paper that was presented was M McCarthy's Programs with Common Sense, in which he describes, but doesn't implement, uh, an intelligent agent that has to get to the airport. This is the advice taker paper, which became extremely significant in the development of symbolic AI. And McCarthy at this time was developing his Lisp uh, language. He hadn't yet finished it. He'd begun work on it. And he refers to the use of a symbolic language uh, in the paper, but he doesn't develop it. And this paper has been cited over 1400 times, although not primarily in its uh, original publication, which was in the proceedings. It provoked substantial argument. Um, Joshua Bar-Hillel uh, of Israel was very cross. Uh, he said it belongs to the belongs in the journal of half-baked ideas. Um, and 
he very, very critical that he thinks that uh, he has a whole load of arguments about it. Uh, and he goes on to say, I do not think that there could possibly exist a program which would, given any problem, divide all the facts in the universe into those which are and which are not relevant uh, to that problem. And Rebecca Skinner in her PhD thesis suggests that this is the first framing of the frame problem of context. Uh, Bar Hillel was probably the most important, significant naysayer at the meeting, uh, and he was got very, very, he was a linguist, so he got very, very cross about machine translation, which he described in one of the discussions as enormously wasteful, totally unrealistic. That was his response to somebody's paper, not just the general field, he was very critical. Uh, and in within a few years, his uh, scepticism, which was probably justified at the time, uh, had killed off US funding for the area. However, uh, this did lead to new scientists the week afterwards, after the meeting had finished, saying that uh, the scientific discussion at Teddington was robust almost to the point of rudeness. Uh, their description of this wasn't primarily based on Bar Hillel. Uh, he said that the people, whoever wrote this uh, under the pen name Geminus, said that the, the people attracted to work with learning machines are inherently individualistic and somewhat intolerant of other people's ideas. Now, what that was referring to was uh, Selfridge's presentation of his work on pandemonium. And in the session on learning in machines, we had what is a bit disappointing, to be honest. It should have been, to, looking back, I expected to find a confrontation at least, or a, at least a, a comparison of Selfridge's pandemonium, which you can see on the left, and Rosenblatt's, um, uh, Rosenblatt's perceptron, which was also presented there. But nobody seemed interested in comparing them, not in the discussions. The two researchers didn't comment on each other's paper in any way, and they just seemed to have been presented as two alternative ways of developing systems of pattern recognition, but presented at the time as a way of getting learning in machines rather than, as I think most people would now conceive them in terms of uh, the problems associated with pattern recognition. McCulloch, uh, Warren McCulloch was also there. He presented a, a kind of souped up version of his, um, uh, his and McCulloch and Pitt's uh, 1943 paper uh, with a highly complex version of this unstable, stable, this was just one example of an alternate, alternating uh, net that would be able to uh, process various things. And this led to a bit of a row uh, with the kind of argument that traditionally comes up when a biologists study McCulloch's work in that they just shake their heads and go, well, this isn't biology. Um, and Barlow uh, says that uh, it would be rather dreadful if any, everybody thought that all physiologists would agree that a model neuron does that. And J.Z. Young, uh, the biologist says, would it not be better not to use the word neuron? McCulloch says, well, look, these are just formal neurons, and that's from Neumann's uh, description. But it was interesting to see that there was this clash between the ultra formalism of McCulloch, which was to have its main impact in computing rather than in biology, because neurons don't look like that, and the biologists who are getting frustrated. For the press, in terms of what they drew out of it, a new scientist accompanied the meeting with this paper by Andrew on learning machines. And the kind of processes that Andrew, which he also gave a talk and a demonstration of his learning machine, uh, are involved in a, a basic relatively simple feedback systems. But the key thing is he's trying to instantiate them in uh, machines, which is in actual physical hardware, which is probably not the way we would uh, think of things uh, these days. Butley, who helped, uh, who organized the meeting, he presented his conditional learning machine machines which learn from past experience. Uh, and you can see here's both got the device, um, a model of it, but also a little piece of uh, mechanical wheel driven machine that was able to actually uh, perform that. And this aspect of demonstrations was very common at the time, but has sadly disappeared uh, from meetings. I've never been to a meeting at which anybody demonstrated uh, their uh, apparatus, their approach, uh, but there are a whole series of them which were uh, significant, in particular, um, not only those to do with uh, machines, but also uh, to do with library retrieval, early history of documentation, of trying to make sense of the growing literature 
and people complaining that there was just too much literature and they couldn't cope with it. This is a, a common theme of academia. Uh, you can see it way back in the 1950s. Uh, if only they knew what was coming. Um, one of the interesting uh, devices that was presented was by Andrew Agen from uh, Budapest, who showed what he called a machine of reproductrix, which was basically a version of Walter's tortoise. Um, and you can see Walter's tortoise was uh, basically positive feedback uh, guided by light going, which was goes back to Salino, the electric dog from 1912. Uh, but what Angan what did was to get it to enable, enable it to uh, associate the sound of music played by a flute uh, and light. So he was able to both uh, guide it by light and by sound. New scientists coverage of the meeting uh, focused on the following aspects. This was in the first three days. They weren't able, they had to go to press before the final day. Uh, Rosenbratt's perceptron, uh, particularly interesting intrigued them. McCarthy's common sense. Uh, Mackay's looking at how to make a machine with intellect and arguing that you needed both analog and digital uh, approaches. Minsky's programs that could solve geometrical problems. We heard a bit about that yesterday. Pacha's automated diagnosis. This was an early version of an expert system that could give a medical diagnosis. Uh, Angian's uh, robot. And finally, Gordon Pask's representation of a concept, which is probably the most eccentric thing was presented there. Uh, Pask claimed that this was the physical analog of the growth of a concept and basically had a, a big dish uh, with um, uh, ferrous sulfate inside it and he put wires in it and the wires would then lead to a precipitation which would change the pattern of the current that was diffusing in this uh, pool. And he claimed that this was the physical analog the growth of a concept. Unfortunately, also accompanied by his talk by baffling diagrams uh, such as this. Nature's summary was fairly similar to that of uh, New Scientist. It went through all the various talks and described them. Time magazine uh, had a small feature on it uh, on the meeting in the 8th of December, focusing on the, the nature of intelligence, learning, expert systems particularly interested it, medicine and music. Um, the role of computing in administration, but also uh, Bar Hillel's critiques, which hit home at least to the journalists. So I think you can see the legacy of this meeting in all of these areas of which would now be seen as separate, symbolic AI, neural nets, development of computer science and programming languages, machine translation, robotics, expert systems, and information retrieval and storage, which is to go on to be extremely significant in the 1960s and the 1970s. But with the exception of McCarthy's paper, there's only a handful of citations per presentation. So the direct impact of this in the literature is not, is rather hazy. And uh, fewer than half of the participants ended up working in computer science, so they, they, their careers branched out just like the, um, the research areas did. And around a quarter of the researchers ended up working or were already working on biological systems. And I think probably the significance of this meeting and why we had all that positive people's descriptions and saying how fascinating and exciting and important it was, this was probably the last time that these topics were discussed in the same place with a degree of mutual comprehension as the development of computing and computer languages and symbolic AI in particular rapidly led to a divergence between these fields. So I guess the question for us is whether historians can hope to emulate that breadth that took place uh, in Teddington in 1958 or are we also trapped in present day silos? And is it, is, it, is it possible for anybody to have a full appreciation of the significance of that meeting without focusing in on one particular aspect, McCarthy, or A, the development of, uh, of, of expert systems or whatever? And with that, thank you. <laughs>